Number 10, Haley Williams. One day in April 2004, a young Sunday school teacher named Haley Williams left her home in Wales for the Alton Towers theme park, which she had visited several times before. Several hours later, she fell 120 feet to her death from a water coaster called the Hydro. Haley fell from the very top of the ride, which had opened just two years earlier, after swapping seats with another passenger. A 2006 inquest ruled that the passenger safety bar had been left open and in an unsafe position after employees failed to carry out proper restraint checks. The 24-seat hydro coaster plunges in a near vertical drop at 50 miles per hour, creating a 45-foot wave. After Haley's death, the park allegedly promised her mother, Beverly, that it would not promote the ride in its advertisements. But if that was the case, then the company lied or went back on its word in 2016, when the ride appeared several times throughout the park's TV commercial. By then, the ride had been renamed to the Drenched Coaster. Beverly told Wales Online that she had spoken to a park representative the previous year and they had promised to keep their word on not showing the ride in the park's promotions. In addition to wondering why the ride appeared in the park's advertisement, she said she didn't understand why the water coaster wasn't dismantled, period, even though she also acknowledged that it's the park's biggest money earner. Number 9. Ferris Wheel Worker Falls to His Death 62-year-old subcontractor Robert Sanger was working at Gillian's Wonderland Pier along the Jersey Shore in May of 2022 when he fell out of a Ferris wheel lift and died. According to news reports, Sanger was fixing the ride in preparation for the upcoming summer tourism season when he took the fatal 144-foot plunge. Jay Gillian, the park's owner and the mayor of Ocean City, confirmed Sanger's death while the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, began an investigation into the tragedy. In early 2023, the press of Atlantic City revealed that OSHA had fined Gillian's Wonderland $10,151 and that the park was fighting the penalty. According to the investigation's findings, Sanger fell to his death when the concrete beneath the lift he was using collapsed. A citation was also issued against the company Sanger worked for, Cargo Tech, but it was quickly settled for $8,700 in fines while the case against the park itself lingered. Gillian declined to comment on the matter, but the park is still open and so is the Ferris wheel, so it's probably safe to assume that the issue got sorted out one way or another. Number 8. Fatal Fall in 2013, a 52-year-old woman named Rosa Irene Ayala Gaona fatally plunged out of the 14-story Texas giant roller coaster at the Six Flags Amusement Park in Arlington, Texas. She was riding the coaster with her daughter and son-in-law when she suddenly began screaming for help. Ayala Gaona fell 75 feet to her death. According to her family, the bar that was supposed to hold her in place malfunctioned during the ride's first descent. In a lawsuit, the woman's loved ones claimed that the ride's security systems were not operating properly. Six Flags denied that its mechanical systems failed. Meanwhile, authorities remained tight-lipped about the cause of the accident and the circumstances leading up to it. The only thing anyone seemed willing to say for certain was that no foul play appeared to be involved. The ride was advertised as the world's tallest wooden coaster when it debuted in 1990. By the time the 2013 accident happened, it had been renovated into the world's tallest partially steel hybrid coaster due to overwhelming complaints about the all-wooden ride's roughness. The circumstances surrounding Ayala Gaona's deadly accident remain largely shrouded in mystery to this day. Despite the park's denial of any wrongdoing, the roller coaster was closed for several months while its restraint system was redesigned. Since then, there have been no more incidents involving the ride. Number 7. Worker dies less than a week after beginning his job. In 2016, a 68-year-old retired postal worker named Steve Boer took a part-time job at Iowa's Adventureland in Altoona theme park. At the time, he and his wife Gladys were traveling the country in their RV and had decided to stop in the area for the summer. Steve enjoyed his first several days on the job, according to Gladys, who later wrote on social media that her husband really enjoyed watching visitors enjoy themselves on the rides. 
Sadly, things took a tragic turn on Steve's sixth day at work while he was operating a water slide called the Raging River. He fell onto the ride's conveyor belt, which moved the individual boats through the station where passengers embarked and disembarked, and suffered a fractured skull and a major brain injury. Onlookers flocked to help Steve and he was rushed to the hospital where he fell into a coma. He succumbed to his injuries after languishing on life support and remaining unresponsive for three days. Five years later in 2021, one of the Raging River's boats overturned while carrying six passengers. Four riders were hospitalized with severe injuries and one of them later died. The ride had been inspected that very day and had been deemed to be in good working order. In 2023, the park announced that it will not be reopening the Raging River ride in light of the tragedies that have occurred in recent years. Number 6. Critical Log Ride Mishap A mother was left critically injured and two other members of her family were also hurt when a log flume ride overturned at Castle Park in Riverside, California in May of 2019. The woman, her husband and their child were all taken to the hospital following the incident. According to officials, emergency responders had received a call about someone being trapped beneath one of the ride's log cars. Riverside Fire Captain Brian Gazetta said that when he and fellow responders arrived on scene, it was apparent that the ride had malfunctioned. Reports later revealed that the accident was caused by a malfunctioning water pump. According to Gazetta, there was no water flowing on the ride like there should have been, causing the log to fly down a hill at an incredible rate of speed and turning the of the car. It was unclear what height the ride was at when she was catapulted from the vehicle. The log the family was riding in eventually came to a stop in an area where the water was shallow. Gazetta said that the mother was responsive while being tended to by emergency personnel and that she was doing well despite being critically injured. Number 5. Double Amputee Falls From Roller Coaster A woman was seriously injured in early 2019 when she fell out of the El Loco roller coaster at the Circus Circus Adventure Dome theme park in Las Vegas. According to a subsequent report, she was between 25 and 30 years old and was a double amputee. It was unclear whether she was secured safely into her seat before she was ejected from the ride. Whether it was her legs or arms that had been amputated, and whether or not the ride somehow malfunctioned. She was rushed to the hospital, but authorities declined to go into detail about the nature of her injuries. In fact, they said very little beyond clarifying that the woman survived the ordeal. A report stated that an investigation was underway into the causes for the accident. In the meantime, the ride was closed down. The El Loco roller coaster opened in 2014 as a replacement for an aging log flume ride. While the details of the 2019 accident are still unknown, the ride was eventually reopened and remains in operation today. Number 4. Deadly Derailment one person died and several others were injured when a roller coaster derailed in Stockholm, Sweden in June of 2023. The tragedy occurred on a ride called the Jetline during what began as a normal day at the Grona Lund amusement park. In addition to the life that was lost, seven survivors were hospitalized with injuries and at least two others were hurt. As soon as the derailment happened, the park was evacuated so rescue crews could get to work and an investigation could be carried out. SVT reporter Jenny Lagerstedt, who was visiting the park for fun and waiting in line for another ride, happened to witness the accident. She said that the coaster derailed at a high altitude and that the first sign of anything being wrong came when she heard a metallic thud, followed by the ride starting to shake. One witness described seeing people falling and flying out of the ride. Another said that two or three people fell out of the ride, while at least one passenger managed to avoid falling by clinging to the tracks. According to the most recent updates on the case, authorities were still investigating the deadly incident. Number 3. Near Fatal Log Flume Fiasco Four people were injured, two of whom were left fighting for their lives after a log flume ride derailed at the Alao Fun Park in Athens, Greece in September 2022. According to news reports, the ride, called La Isla, was traveling at a high rate of speed at the time of the accident. Four passengers were thrown from their log and landed in some nearby bushes. A 21-year-old woman underwent critical care for a chest injury, while a 24-year-old man required emergency surgery for a ruptured spleen. 
The other two passengers were a 22-year-old woman who suffered a concussion and a 25-year-old man who was lucky enough to walk away with only minor injuries. Despite these reports, the park issued a statement denying that the ride had derailed and insisting that it was perfectly safe. Some news sources claimed that the log flume's water level was incorrect, causing the brakes to fail on the log that derailed. The police reportedly arrested two people, including a shift manager and a legal representative, but it's unclear whether any charges were ever brought against anyone. Number 2. French Woman Falls from Formula One Roller Coaster During what was supposed to be a fun family trip to a theme park in northern France in 2020, a 32-year-old woman fell out of a roller coaster and died. The unfortunate tragedy happened on a Formula One coaster at Parc Saint-Paul in Oise, which had recently reopened in the wake of the first COVID lockdown. According to news reports, the woman was at the park with her husband, sister and mother to celebrate a family member's birthday. It was her first ever visit to the park. Her husband tried to grab her foot and save her after he noticed her falling over the safety bar mid-ride but it was no use. She fell off, and by the time emergency responders arrived, it was unfortunately too late to resuscitate the woman, despite their best efforts. It was the second time a deadly accident had occurred on the ride, with the first having occurred 11 years earlier in 2009. During this earlier incident, a 35-year-old woman allegedly caused her own death due to inappropriate behavior, and the park was not held responsible for the tragedy. Two other prior incidents resulted in the park's owner, Gilles Campion, paying a fine and receiving a four-month suspended prison sentence. In 2005, another roller coaster called the Nacelle reportedly derailed and crashed into a metal pole, leaving four passengers seriously injured. A month before that, a similar malfunction injured 11 passengers. But the park and its roller coasters, including the infamous Formula One ride, are still in operation, which means that any necessary changes have been made to ensure that the attractions are safe. And now for number one. But if you want to hear even more stories, stay tuned for some extra content that you might have missed. Number one, Tyre Sampson. One night in 2022, the mother and father of a young man named Tyre Dodd received a phone call that every parent dreads. Their son had died in a horrifying accident during a visit at an Orlando amusement park. By the time Tyre's parents got the news, footage of the teen falling off a 400-foot freefall ride had already gone viral, and it was clear based on the video that there was no way the victim could have survived. Tyre was visiting the Icon Park with family and friends during spring break, when the tragedy occurred. At more than six feet tall and weighing over 300 pounds, he was too big for some of the rides. In fact, he had been turned away from several rides throughout the day before employees let him onto the Orlando Freefall drop tower. The teen fell out of his seat and onto the pavement below right after the initial drop. A friend who rode the drop tower with Tyre later said that Tyre could tell that his seat wasn't properly secured. In a heartbreaking final request to his friends, he asked them to make sure his parents knew he loved them. According to officials, multiple violations were to blame for the tragedy. Employees had failed to properly secure Tyre's seatbelt. They shouldn't have let him onto the ride in the first place. Inspectors said that they were seeking to revoke the park's operating permit for the ride and that they were planning to pursue a $250,000 fine. Florida Representative Geraldine Thompson vowed to propose a bill in Tyre's honor calling for stricter safety regulations at theme parks to make sure that no other families have to endure such unspeakable suffering. In early 2023, the ride that Tyre died on was dismantled. Meanwhile, Tyre's family reached an out-of-court settlement with the park in order to resolve a wrongful death lawsuit that they filed after his unexpected passing. Number 12. Morris Solomon Jr. Better known as the Sacramento Slayer or the Homicidal Handyman, Handyman Morris Solomon Jr. killed at least six women in less than a year during the late 1980s. The murders occurred in Sacramento's Oak Park neighborhood. The victims included prostitutes, drug addicts, and other vulnerable women. Police began investigating Solomon in June of 1986 after he reported the discovery of 22-year-old Yolanda Johnson's body at a house where he was working. About a month later, the remains of 25-year-old Angela Polidor were discovered in a shallow grave 
outside a house where Solomon had worked. Detectives suspected Solomon of being involved, but didn't have enough to charge him. He walked free despite having four misdemeanor warrants for his arrest for unrelated crimes. Solomon continued to kill, and the discoveries of bodies outside homes he lived or worked at continued. The victims had been discarded in similar ways, and were often bound, wrapped in bedding, and or partially nude. In many cases, it was impossible to determine the cause of death due to decomposition. Solomon was finally arrested on suspicion of murder in April of 1987. There was no direct evidence connecting him to the cases, but the jury nevertheless voted to convict him on six out of seven counts of murder. He's currently on death row in San Quentin State Prison. Despite the horrific nature of Solomon's actions, his crimes failed to garner national attention. They were overshadowed by the actions of another serial killer from Sacramento named Dorothea Puente, who killed as many as nine of her elderly and disabled tenants for their social security checks. She went to trial at around the same time as Sullivan, and the country was too wrapped up in the so-called death house landlady to pay much attention to the gruesome crimes committed by the homicidal handyman. Number 11. Almaz Ibrev In late 2022, police in St. Petersburg received a missing persons report about a 27-year-old hairstylist named Yuliana. Officers went to the young woman's brand new apartment and found her body in a garbage bag. There was also construction debris from work that was being carried out on the unit in the bag. Someone had bludgeoned and strangled her. Investigators discovered that on the day Juliana died, she had stopped by at the apartment to check up on the progress of the work. She was seen in surveillance footage entering the building's elevator, but she never left. Suspicion immediately fell on 41-year-old Almaz Ibrave, who was performing the renovation on Juliana's apartment. When the story broke, authorities were unsure of a motive, but suspected that Ibrave feared he wouldn't get paid for his poorly done work. He was seen on camera exiting the elevator after Juliana's murder. Police tracked her brave down at a local hostel and arrested him in connection with the case. Number 10. Jose Diaz Retired Villanova University professor Carol Ambruster arrived at her Philadelphia apartment one evening in 2013 and was fatally ambushed by an intruder, who was later identified as the building's handyman, Jose Diaz. He grabbed a kitchen knife with an 8-inch, 20-centimeter blade and stabbed the 69-year-old 11 times. Ambruster's roommate came home to find her dead on the floor with the knife lodged in her neck. DNA, shoe print, and fingerprint evidence tied Diaz to the scene, and prosecutors accused him of murdering Ambruster in a robbery gone wrong. The defense pointed the finger at Ambruster's roommate, Daniel Sapon, a friend of over 30 years who denied ever being romantically involved with the victim or having any reason to harm her. A witness who lived in the building and found Sapon in the hallway yelling for help testified that he seemed genuinely shaken and distraught. Diaz was convicted of first-degree murder, robbery, and other crimes related to the incident and received a mandatory life sentence without parole. Number 9. Carrie Stainer 42-year-old Carol Sund, her daughter Julie, and Julie's friend, an exchange student named Sylvina Peloso, were reported missing in February 1999 during a sightseeing trip to Yosemite National Park. Carol Sund and Peloso's charred bodies were found in the trunk of Sund's car the following month. Julie Sund's remains were recovered after police received a taunting note from the killer detailing their location. The FBI interviewed staff at the Cedar Lodge Motel, where the women stayed on the last night before they disappeared. Among those questioned was Carrie Stainer, a clean-cut handyman with no history of violence, and whose younger brother, Stephen Stainer, had famously survived a seven-year kidnapping during the 1970s. He was initially ruled out as a suspect. Several months later, the decapitated body of 26-year-old Yosemite naturalist Joy Ruth Armstrong turned up near a cabin where she was staying. Eyewitness accounts linked Stainer's truck to the crime, and the FBI found him hiding out at a nudist resort in Wilton, California. He confessed to murdering Armstrong and the three previous victims. He was charged with four counts of murder. In a jailhouse interview with KBWB reporter Ted Rowland, Stainer said that he had fantasized about killing someone since childhood. After claiming his first three victims, he staved off the urge to do it again, but at some point he could no longer hold back. 
He admitted that the only reason the women were targeted was for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Stainer has been on death row at San Quentin since 2002, but there haven't been any executions in California since 2006, and it looks as though the state may officially abolish the death penalty at some point in the near future. In that case, the sentences of Stainer and the nearly 700 other prisoners on death row would most likely be commuted to life. Number 8. Bruman Stalin Alvarez 911 dispatchers in Maryland received an alarming call one night in 1995 when a handyman claimed to have killed his boss at a home in the wealthy Potomac suburb. Officers arrived to find 20-year-old Bruman Stalin Alvarez standing in the driveway with blood on his clothes. Inside the house, they found the brutally slain bodies of 46-year-old podiatrist Dr. David Mark Goff, his three daughters and Alvarez's boss, 30-year-old Mark Richard Aldridge. They had been bound, bludgeoned, and stabbed. Alvarez had been hired to paint and do remodeling work inside the home on multiple occasions in the months leading up to the murders. He claimed that Aldridge had killed the four other victims and that he killed Aldridge after discovering the carnage. But details of his story didn't add up, and inside Alvarez's backpack, police found stolen jewelry from the Goff household, as well as the family's telephone, which had been ripped out of a wall. Authorities charged Alvarez with five counts of first-degree murder. The evidence was stacked strongly against him during his trial, pointing toward his guilt despite the prosecution's failure to establish a clear-cut motive. An official source told the Washington Post that Alvarez committed the murders in an attempt to copy the storyline of a horror movie, although they declined to specify which film he was inspired by. Alvarez took a deal to avoid the death penalty and received six life sentences. He subsequently fought to have his plea reversed, but the judge rejected the request. In 2000, Alvarez asked for a new trial and was denied. More than 20 years after the crime, he challenged his sentence but was unsuccessful. He remains behind bars, and thankfully it seems as though that's where he'll spend the rest of his days. Number 7. Jerome Isaac in what a judge described as one of the most horrific crimes he had ever seen, a self-proclaimed Rastafarian handyman named Jerome Isaac doused an elderly woman with gasoline and set her on fire at an apartment building in Brooklyn's Prospect Heights neighborhood. The murder happened in 2011, when 73-year-old Dolores Gillespie was returning home from grocery shopping. She took the elevator up to the fifth floor as she came face to face with Isaac. The senior citizen cowered in the corner of the elevator as Isaac covered her head to toe in gasoline, then lit her on fire and hurled a lit Molotov cocktail at her. She died at the scene, screaming in agony as she clutched her groceries. A court would later learn that Isaac had lived with Gillespie for a short time while also doing odd jobs for her. He claimed that she owed him $2,000 for unpaid work, which investigators believed was his motivation for killing her. According to Gillespie's family, she had refused to pay the handyman because he stole from her. Isaac fled the scene, but later turned himself in after police released surveillance footage of the attack and asked the public for help identifying the suspect. He appeared at the police station reeking of gasoline and with serious burns on his face and allegedly bragged to investigators about how they would have never found him if he hadn't surrendered. Isaac took a deal and pleaded guilty to murder and arson charges and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Number 6. Robert Jason Owens 38-year-old celebrity chef Christy Schoen Codd was pregnant when she and her husband, 45-year-old Joseph J.T. Codd, were reported missing from their North Carolina home in 2015. The couple's friend, Robert Jason Owens, became a suspect several days later after a neighbor reported seeing him with unusually large garbage bags outside his house. Police paid him a visit and found the Codd's charred and dismembered remains inside a wood stove on his property. Owens was a contractor who had done work on the family's home. He claimed that he accidentally ran over the victims while they were helping him with his car. According to his attorney, he was heavily impaired from taking prescription medication when the incident occurred. Owens took a plea deal and admitted to killing and dismembering the Cods. He was sentenced to a minimum of 59 and a half years in prison. As part of the agreement, prosecutors dropped robbery charges resulting from Owens' admission 
that he had broken into the victim's home and stolen their belongings. In an odd twist, Owens was connected to the disappearance of 18-year-old Zeb Quinn, who vanished in 2000. He was the last person known to have seen Quinn alive, but remained tight-lipped on the matter until after he was charged with the young man's murder in 2017. Owens claimed that his uncle, who is now deceased, killed Quinn in a murder-for-hire plot and admitted to helping his uncle burn Quinn's remains, which were never found. He pleaded guilty to accessory after the fact and is serving a minimum of 12 and a half years concurrently with his other sentence. Number 5. Peter Tobin Shortly after his release from a decade-long prison sentence for assault, Peter Tobin changed his name to Pat McLaughlin to avoid detection for his past crimes and became a handyman at a church in Glasgow, Scotland. Just two years later, in 2006, a 23-year-old Polish student named Angelica Kluck vanished while working as a cleaner at the same church. Tobin was initially one of three suspects, but he put himself at the top of the list when he vanished after questioning. It wasn't until they released his photo to the public that police learned his real identity. Clark's remains were found hidden in a hatch beneath the church's floor. Based on the brutal nature of her death, investigators suspected they had a serial killer on their hands. Tobin was found living in London under yet another alias and was extradited to Scotland to face justice for Clark's murder. In the meantime, detectives were hard at work tracing his movements as far back as possible. It was no easy task. Tobin had at least 60 previous addresses, but the painstaking investigation paid off when law enforcement connected his whereabouts to two of Scotland's most perplexing cold cases. A search of two of Tobin's previous residences turned up the buried remains of two young women who went missing in 1991, Vicky Hamilton and Dinah McNichol. To this day, authorities remain almost certain that Tobin is responsible for the deaths of more victims who have not yet been found. He was found guilty of murdering Cluck, McNichol, and Hamilton, and is serving a life sentence. Number 4. Justin Smith and Terry Ballard Elderly couple Rufus and Gladys Perry were found strangled to death in their Philadelphia home in 2014. Neighbors told police that they had seen 26-year-old Terry Ballard, whose grandmother was a close friend of the victims, and 19-year-old Justin Smith in the couple's yard earlier that day. During questioning, both suspects, who were in a romantic relationship, reportedly confessed to the brutal double murder. Prior to the crime, the couple had run out of money while partying in Atlantic City. They went to the Perry's house, where Gladys let them in, thinking Ballard's grandmother had sent him over to help out with chores. While they were there, Gladys caught Ballard rummaging through her belongings. He responded by fatally attacking the senior citizen. Rufus Perry tried coming to his wife's aid, but was smothered by Ballard and Smith. The suspects fled the scene with a gold chain and change jar containing around $120 in coins. Sadly, the crime boiled down to a desperation for money, according to Assistant District Attorney Richard Sachs, who told the Philadelphia Inquirer that Smith and Ballard had nowhere to stay and were trying to travel to Western Pennsylvania. Both defendants pleaded guilty to robbery, conspiracy, and two counts of third-degree murder. They received identical prison sentences of 38 to 76 years. Number 3. Gary Fry In a horrifying act of violence that was captured on camera, 39-year-old Gary Fry stabbed his friend multiple times at a drug treatment facility in 2018. Fry was a troubled addict with 99 priors on his record when he sought treatment at the rehab in the English town of Torquay. He excelled at getting his life back on track, and the center hired him on as a handyman. A few weeks before the attack, Fry's friend and fellow resident, Justin Morrison, revealed that Fry's girlfriend had tried to hook up with him. Morrison assured Fry that nothing happened, and as far as he knew, the incident didn't affect their friendship. But Fry was apparently more upset than he let on, and he waited until it was least expected to inflict revenge on his unsuspecting friend. Footage of the attack showed Fry standing casually with his hands in his pocket in a communal area of the residence while Morrison got some tea and filled a cigarette lighter. Out of nowhere, Fry grabbed a blade and stabbed Morrison three times. Morrison fled to another room and collapsed on the floor. Luckily, he survived and was discharged from the hospital later that day after receiving stitches for his wounds. Things could have turned out much worse, according to the judge who oversaw Fry's criminal case for the attack, 
who said that Morrison would have likely died if the blade had punctured him just a centimeter or two away from one of the wound sites. In court, Fry's attorney said that his client was deeply remorseful for his actions and that he lost his temper for a few seconds after seeing some text messages indicating that something may have happened between Morrison and his girlfriend. Fry admitted to causing grievous bodily harm with intent and was sentenced to four years in prison. Number two, David Benola. 51-year-old married mother of two, Orsolia Gall, returned to her apartment in Queens after a night out in April of 2022 and was ambushed by her longtime on and off lover, 44-year-old handyman David Benola, who stabbed her more than 50 times. Benola crammed Gall's mutilated lifeless body into a duffel bag and left it at an intersection in the Forest Hills neighborhood where it was found by a dog walker several hours later. Surveillance footage captured Benola wheeling the bag out of the residence and there was a trail of blood leading from where he left it all the way back to the crime scene. In addition to the evidence that was already stacking against him, Benola reportedly offered to speak to police days after the murder and made incriminating statements against himself. According to Queen's District Attorney Melinda Katz, he eventually confessed to stabbing the victim during an argument, then moving her body. Benola told detectives that he killed Gal because she gave him HIV during their two-year affair. He believed that his lover, who lived with her husband, had cheated on him, stating that she couldn't be with one person, and he accused Gal of lying to him and using him. To avoid a trial, Benola took a deal and pleaded guilty to manslaughter in exchange for a 25-year sentence, followed by five years of probation. Number 1. Carlos Medina in early 2023, Los Angeles County deputies responded to a call about a person not breathing and found 69-year-old Catholic Bishop David O'Connell shot to death in his Hacienda Heights home. Their investigation led them to 61-year-old handyman Carlos Medina, whose wife worked as a housekeeper for O'Connell and who they believe had done work at the bishop's residence. According to a tip, Medina had been complaining in the time leading up to the murder about O'Connell owing him money. He also drove an SUV matching the description of a vehicle that was captured on surveillance video in the victim's driveway around the time of the murder. By the time he fell on the suspect list, Medina had left the area. After receiving word that he had returned home several days later, police went to his residence at around 2 o'clock in the morning. Medina refused to answer the door for hours, and a tactical team was sent inside to carry out a warrant for his arrest. Inside the home, they reportedly found two guns and other evidence linked to the crime. After being taken into custody, Medina allegedly confessed to the crime. He remains behind bars on $2 million bail while awaiting the next steps in the case. Thanks for watching. Would you be willing to ride a roller coaster that someone had recently fallen off of? Or would you be hesitant even if the ride had been inspected and received a clean bill of health? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.